Hello, good day, and welcome to Go on the Run. Today, we're going to start the section on NATS, and this is part one of that section. So, what is NATS? Well, NATS describes itself as a connectivity technology, and we're going to see why in over this section as we go through the section. So, as not to make this video too long, Let's just jump in and look at some of the problems that Nat tries to solve, and then we'll see later on how to put this technology to use. So in this video, we'll talk a little bit about a problem and the desired solution, and then why we would want to use something like Nat. So let's say that you have several microservices. And here I'm showing seven. Now we haven't had to deal with this many microservices, but um, if you're working over there at some company that has microservices, seven is by far not a high number. Many companies would have about 30 and some as much as hundreds of microservices. So this is really not a lot. And so remember, microservices are aimed to break up your much larger application into these smaller pieces where a single service does something very specific, is responsible for one domain, and those other services can contact it. So for maybe, for example, if you build out a shopping application, you might have a microservice that's responsible for the orders. You might have another one that's responsible for shipping. You might have another one responsible for payment and that sort of thing. So let's say in your application these microservices need to communicate with each other in this way so service one needs to somehow communicate with service two and service microservice four and then you can see the lines there like microservice three needs to communicate with microservice four and microservice five and you can see the lines get sort of crazy and what if over time you need to let's say add login or something or email and so now you introduce a microservice eight and now, you know, maybe you want microservice four and five to talk to eight. And now you see you have to go update them to do that. And now that you you don't need to update them, I mean, if there's a new service that you're going to introduce that you want existing service to use, surely you have to update the old services. But now microservice four and five need to know exactly where to find microservice eight so they can use it. And then let's say you again update your application with some new capability and that is provided by microservice nine. And so let's say you want microservice S1 and S7 to use that service provided microservice nine. You can see they too have to be updated to talk to that service. And then you have these lines that are going all over the place. If you try to understand what your application is doing, there's just all these lines of who, which service is talking to which service. And it could get very confusing. Like I said, many applications would have many more microservices than that. So that's the problem, right? Is that we have many microservices that need to communicate with each other. We have apps that need to be resilient against failure. So when services go down and so on, apps should scale seamlessly. Now, Kubernetes allows us to do some of this. And we're going to see more of this as we go through what, can, what Kubernetes can do and what Kubernetes can do and why we might need something to use something like NATS. And then we want to be able to, when we add new services, we should, or remove services, we should do that with minimal disruption, ideally without any disruption, right? But if we, there is a, should be some disruption, it should be minimal. So what would our desired solution look like? Well, we want to be able to connect many decoupled applications or services, and we want to make this easy to do, right? So if we're going to have many microservices or application, we don't want it to be hard to connect the pieces. We want it to be very seamless and simple. We want to do this securely and we want to provide flexibility in being able to use message and patterns. And we'll learn more about the different types of message and pattern. We're not going to cover all of them, but we'll certainly bump into a few of them. And we want to do this at scale. Now, for what we do and playing around on our desktop, we don't need to worry about scale. But remember, if you work in a company and this is a solution that you're going to be working on, you also need to think about making it scalable. So let's go back to when we had microservices that needs to connect. And like I showed, we had this really crazy thing where all these services connected to each other. Well, we could sort of think about simplifying this. And the way we'll think about it is in how we connect our computers. 
when we have a computers and we want to connect them, we don't connect wires from the one computer to the other one it needs to talk to. We actually connect it to a common infrastructure, which is the network. And then we have the computers use addressing to be able to say which computer they should be able to send the message to or communicate. Same thing here. We can sort of see our microservices as just individual components or things that do work. And instead, what we introduce is a fabric for communication. Or you could think of it like a bus or a fabric. I mean, I'm going to use those interchangeably sometime. And now what you can do is have each microservice now be able to communicate with that bus or you know, fabric on that fabric. And because you can do that, we're not going to talk about how they can address each other, but just imagine that microservice one wants to talk to microservice seven, it would simply be able to send a message and say, hey, I want this to go to microservice seven. And you can think of this as, yes, it can use the name microservice seven to send it, but no, it doesn't have to really need to worry about where exactly microservice seven is. It's going to use this bus to get to it or this fabric. So what happens when we introduce a new microservice? You can see, we just have to make that new microservice be able to talk on the bus. And sure, even if we update microservice four so it can talk to microservice eight, Again, Microservice 4 just simply know that it needs to know that it's just a new microservice with an address that it needs to reach out to. That's it. It doesn't need to know where it's running, nothing that it doesn't need to try to connect to it directly. It's an indirect connection because it's using the bus or the messaging fabric in this case, NAT for us. And similarly, when we introduce Microservice 9, same thing. The way in which you bring a service into operation is just simply making it available you know, to be able to talk on this bus, this common interface. And then the other things can, that needs to talk to that thing can be updated whenever they need to use that service. So here are some of the features um, of NATS. And I put them all here at once because I don't want to go through them individually. As we learn about NATS, we will learn about some of these features and we'll see the benefits of some of them and so on. But it's just quite a lot. This is not all of them. I got this from another slide about NATS and its features. And so um, put some of those on here, not all of them. And so if we talk about how uh, we install and set up NATS, um, we said one of the things we like is something that was simple and easy to use, right? And so NAT as security out of the box, it's a very simple application in terms of its packages. A simple single binary is written in Go. And so you can run it as a binary on your computer. You can install it on almost any system where Go runs, because you can build this with Go. Um, you can even run it in, from Docker if you don't actually want to do an actual installation. And of course, you can run it in Kubernetes. And then once you do the installation, once you pick your installation type, the second thing you do is just start it up. And <laughs> we'll see that it's very easy to start up. In terms of configuring to get started, you, you don't really need to unless you keep adding more features and so on, and you need more capabilities, then you configure those. So let's see what installation looks like. So you head over to HTTP, that's NAT.io. You click on documentation. Then you scroll down on the left-hand side and look for installing a NAT server. That's going to give you all the options for installing NAT. So if you want to run NAT's Docker image, this is how you can do it. You just run Docker run. And in this example, I use minus RM so that once I stop the Docker image, it's going to clean up. But I'm only doing that for now while we're playing around. But you can choose to use minus RM or not. Um, and then we want to expose a port that we can connect to. And so you guys know this already. We've done Docker. And this pulls the Docker image and runs it. You're going to see a few more lines like pulling and finish pulling and all that stuff before it starts running. But since I pulled already, once I issue this command, you can see it just start the server. It says start in that server. It tells you your version. At this time of this video, it's version 2.9.11 and all that good stuff. And it tells you that it's listening. And that's it. Now, another option is that you can do a binary install. And like I said, NATS runs anywhere Go can run, um, is available. So you, people run NATS in Raspberry Pi, all that stuff. But let's say you're on a Mac, I use brew, because I use own brew to do brew install NATS that server. 
and you see it says fetching it then it finished fetching it and it went ahead and did the installation i didn't show those lines because not nothing exciting there but you have multiple ways of doing it for windows or linux or you could just download the binary or you could build a binary yourself again all those are options but well if you get it installed install in that server if you're not doing the docker if you're doing docker you're done so once you have the binary installed now you just run the NAT server and you run it and that's it again no configuration it tells you it's starting and it's listening and notice this is just as similar to the one in the docker it's just play is ready waiting for client connection and that's it and that's as far as i want to go in this video um, in the next video part two we'll look at how we can connect to it and try doing some things and just keep going from there if you like this video Please subscribe if you're not already a subscriber. If you're a subscriber, thanks. Appreciate it. You being a subscriber, appreciate your patience. And if you have problems with anything or you have concerns, please let me know in the comments. Please thumbs up this video. Um, comment. This helps in terms of the visibility. This helps in terms of visibility and you know getting more people to learn and see what we're doing here. Um, otherwise, take care. See you in the next video. Bye.